Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. I'm your host, Leah Wheatholter, CEO and founder of Workman Forensics in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the author of Data Sleuth, Using Data in Forensic Accounting Engagements and Fraud Investigations. This summer, while at the ACFE Global Fraud Conference, several speakers and friends of the podcast and I got together to play an escape room. Before and after our escape room adventure, I found myself engrossed in stories from investigators around the U.S., and I didn't want the conversation to end. It was these valuable conversations that inspired the format for the next series of Investigation Game podcast episodes. So for the remainder of 2022, at least, I've invited investigators to join me in sharing case stories from investigations worked in a variety of areas. In this episode, I'm joined by Clay Glasgow and Brian Willingham, and we discuss investigations involving estates. Clay is a partner with Hogan Taylor and leads the firm's forensic valuation and litigation services practice. He has over 20 years of experience in public accounting and has provided forensic accounting services throughout most of his career. Clay and his team serve clients in the areas of financial investigations, business disputes, economic damages, and business valuations. Clay enjoys using his accounting expertise to help clients navigate high stakes matters that require careful, objective investigation and analysis. He's a certified public accountant and has also earned the certified in financial forensics, accredited in business valuation, and certified fraud examiner credentials. Brian Willingham has been a private investigator since 2001. For the past 13 years, he's been the founder and president of Diligentia Group and is based in New York. Over the years, he's developed an expertise in open source public record research and developed an open source intelligence course in conjunction with PI education. He's been a regular contributor to a number of industry magazines and publications like PI Magazine and Pursuit Magazine. Brian is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts and is a certified fraud examiner. Welcome to the Investigation Game podcast. I am joined today by Clay Glasgow and Brian Willingham. Thank you both so much for being back here. Great to be here. We're going to talk about a few more case stories. um, And this week, we're just going to talk about cases that we've worked on involving financial statement fraud. So take it away, Clay. Okay. Yeah. I was uh, trying to think of a, of a good story here. So there's, I've seen several different kind of flavors of financial statement fraud. You know, sometimes you'll have financial statements that are uh, fraudulently manipulated in order to man- manipulate some a bank or investors to make the company look better than it is. Or you might have financial statement fraud where the numbers are manipulated to meet certain benchmarks that might impact someone's compensation. But Another one is is where there's there's actually embezzlement at the company and the financial statements are manipulated to cover up the embezzlement. So that that's the story that I have today. Um, so we were brought in on a case involving a. Uh, I have to be kind of vague because the case is still the litigation is still ongoing, but it's a company, a wholesaler of specialty equipment company, uh, specialty equipment and supplies. They sell to a specific industry. And they had an office manager, that was her title, uh, but she really had uh, pretty broad responsibilities and authority within the company. She did all the accounting tasks. She kept the general ledger, made all the accounting entries. She wrote checks. She signed checks. She approved bills. She basically did everything in the, she was a one person finance and accounting function, you know, just textbook, lack of controls. So one day the owner of this company gets a call from the bank informing him that they had flagged some checks that had cleared because the name on the check was the same as the person that signed the check, which was the office manager. And that that happened because no one else was looking at the checks that she she had complete um, authority to to write and sign checks. So obviously was concerned. So he confronted the office manager about it. Immediately, she confessed to him to write, write have written those checks to herself. Um, what she told him was that she was going to pay it back. She was waiting on a home loan, you know, a home equity loan to be approved. And as soon as she got the money, um, she was going to pay it back. So she confessed to the handful of checks that the bank had reported. Uh, so we were brought in to kind of look at it. She was terminated um, kind of on the spot. So we were brought in to investigate further, kind of determine the extent of it all. And it, it turns out that this scheme 
you know, if you want to call it that, I mean, it's not really a scheme. She was just writing checks to herself, started pretty much right after she started employment five years earlier. So she came in and and almost immediately started writing checks to herself. Um, In the first year, it was about $5,000. The second year, it was about $12,000. The third year, it was $53,000. Fourth year, it was $120,000. And by the fifth year, right before she got caught, it was $330,000 in checks written to herself. So a total of about 500,000 over a five year period. But the, it got it got just out of control at the end. And that's that's how the bank caught it. I was kind of interested that, that the bank noticed that. But there, she was just writing so many checks and they were getting larger um, so that the bank flagged it. Um, so we investigated it, kind of identified all of that. She also had her credit card, her and her husband's credit card set up on auto pay with the company's checking account. And there were also just personal expenses that she directly paid with company funds. Uh, so, so when you add all those in, it totaled up to almost a million dollars over five years. So, so that's the embezzlement piece. The financial statement fraud comes into play in how she covered this up, which uh, again, was pretty simple. You know, again, there weren't, weren't any controls to prevent um, something like this, but she would she would write these checks within the accounting system, print the check, go back in the accounting system, void the check, and re-enter a transaction in the same amount, um, you know, for some fraudulent purpose. So, you know, and, and towards the end, when the checks were getting larger, she would have to split up the payment, the transactions into multiple amounts and multiple accounts to try to hide it. And it got really haphazard there at the end. So just uh, a big part of what, what we helped the company through was just cleaning up their accounting records because they're, you know, she was, she was uh, making fraudulent entries to inventory and prepaid expenses and fixed assets. I mean, every, every account on the, on the balance sheet and income statement was affected by this. Um, so the, the Secret Service actually is the federal agency that took over, that investigated it from a law enforcement perspective. Um, she's she's been indicted and is currently awaiting trial. So, um, you know, it's uh, like I said, it's kind of just a classic case of there, there were no controls. And, uh, you know, it's it's interesting in, in a lot of the fraud cases that that I've been involved in, it takes, you know, some, someone is usually not, someone usually does not come in and immediately start committing fraud. Like they uh, maybe have been there a while and some situation in their life causes them to make rationalizations and they, and they start committing fraud. This, this person came in and, and almost immediately started doing this. So it's a little different from, from that perspective as well. But, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, Pretty pretty much it. It wasn't a real complicated scheme. Just a reflection of to- any lack of controls um, within the company. The owner just gave her the keys of the kingdom, and uh, she was probably. I, I think she was probably like a, kind of a. Pre- it was a predatory thing for her because of how quickly she started with the fraud after she was hired. Do you do you know? Has it been found out at all throughout all of this if her previous employer had if she'd stolen from a previous employer or anything like that? I don't know that. Nothing nothing has ever come to my knowledge about it, but it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. That's the, what yeah, I mean. company, there's some sort of red flags there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the company has tried to, I, I assume at some point, if, especially if it goes to trial, it's going to be known who the company is that this affected. But um, to, to this point, they've been able to remain like not named in any of the court filings. So I don't know if they reported it or, or who would report it to pro- to previous em- Employers, but I'm not aware of that. Did you say the Secret Service had taken over it? The case? Mm-hmm. Why was yeah. it that agency as opposed to others? I I assume it had to do with the bank having found the fraud because they do re- they do investigate um, fraud involving the financial system. So, mm-hmm. but that's the only this is the only case I've been involved in that the Secret Service was the law enforcement agency involved. Interesting. Yeah, I remember. Uh, when I worked for the Bureau that Secret Service will take some white collar cases and will work some embezzlement. But I don't remember the specific uh, crimes in that kind of area. But I'm actually really impressed with this bank 
that like the yeah. Bank oh yeah saw the signature and the payee were the same person i mean kudos to yeah, that I, I would like to know i never found out if they had like a software that flagged that or if it was just a you know an employee that was paying attention that noticed yeah. it I, I don't know but yeah it, that is impressive it went it had gone on for a long time so it took took them a while but <laughs> They eventually did. Whenever anyone steals uh, from a company and they've hidden their embezzlement in different financial statement accounts and just really messed up the financials, you know, I feel like the common question is, do we refile our tax returns? And like, what do we do with all of this? Did this company have to like amend tax returns and stuff because of it? They did. Yeah, that that was actually the um, primary like the, the owner really didn't care that much about kind of. I'm pe- peeling back the onion because the money was the money was gone. Um, we had quantified how much was gone, but as far as cleaning up the accounts, but the tax preparer felt strongly that we needed to unwind all of this and file correct tax returns. Cause you, you know that because in order technically to be able to deduct an embezzlement loss, you have to report the amount that was stolen. So we had to um, we had to unwind all of that in order to make the accounting entries to get it all classified as embezzlement loss. Yeah. And I'm assuming it worked in the owner's favor if she was putting a lot of those, I'm going to go a little accountant here, but if she was putting a lot of that stolen money over to the balance sheet, it probably worked in their favor to move that over as a yeah, loss right. on the p So yeah, a lot that of that was out. sitting on the balance sheet. Most of it was. Yeah. Well, that was great. Yeah. Super fascinating. These the kinds of cases always are. And do you know what she spent it on? Oh, yeah. I mean, just, she was a big spender. There were cruises. There was plastic surgery. There was, um, you know, home home expenses, home remodeling, you know, just. Yeah. It, she was uh, living. A, and, and, you know, it was, of course, we asked the owner, were, were there any red flags? Did you know? That? Yeah. And he went through his list of things that, you know, he, he said he wondered how someone on a $50,000 salary could afford these vacations and the plastic surgery and everything. Right. Oh, so, you know, just, but just never connected the dots. Yeah. A lot of times, a lot of the fraud investigators in Oklahoma, you know, we have so many casinos and stuff. They'll say that their number one reason for people stealing for them in the cases they've worked is uh, because of gambling. Right. And mm-hmm. mine are always the shoppers, like what you just described. I've had a couple mm-hmm. maybe that were gambling, but the majority, they just love to buy crap, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Who doesn't? Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, thanks, Clay, for that story. When I joined the financial investigation industry over 15 years ago, my goal was to work as many cases as possible, but getting those first few cases felt extremely challenging. For example, how do I get the casework without the experience? And then how do I get the experience without the casework? And when I get the casework, will I know what to do? So I wrote Data Sleuth using data in forensic accounting engagements and fraud investigations to solve this very problem. It is the book I needed so many years ago. In this book, I explain how to start a financial investigation from case planning to finding best evidence to incorporating non-financial evidence like interviews and open source intelligence, and ultimately how to put it all together for your client or even law enforcement with step-by-step details and case examples. If you want to gain confidence in financial investigations to build your case experience, you need to read my book. Data Sleuth is available on Amazon, Goodreads, or wherever you like to buy books. All right, Brian. Well, mine doesn't fit in perfectly into the financial statement uh, fraud box, uh, but but this is one of my favorite stories. It's one of my favorite cases I've ever worked, uh, and it was a pon- relating to a Ponzi scheme. And Ponzi schemes, I'm like obsessed with Ponzi schemes. Same. The whole the whole way that they carry these things out, the the way that people fall for them, like really smart, intelligent people. Uh, everything about them, I wish I could be involved with them. So, you know, when my role in these kinds of cases is usually, you know, prior to somebody making an investment or in the middle of the investment, they're saying, hey, uh, maybe uh, you need to check this guy out and see if there's something I should have been warned about. And I have worked, I did get the chance to work on, on the Madoff case afterwards where they were trying to find some assets. But nevertheless, this is relating to a guy named Samuel uh, Mooley Cohen. He was uh, what billed as sort of this successful entrepreneur. I was hired in the late 2008, 2009 timeframe. 
where he had about $30, $35 million with a bunch of investors, including the actor, Danny Glover, uh, who had invested with him. And his pitch was that, you know, for one, that he had generated billions of dollars in shareholder value for everybody. He had had successful biotechnology companies. He was an Israeli. um, And that, you know, his big deal was that he had some sort of stock in this company, ECAS it was called, that was going to get um, sold and and traded or um, exchanged for Microsoft shares, which at the time, Microsoft is not as big of a deal now, but still it was going to be sold to Microsoft and become Microsoft shares. So that was like the his million dollar plan. And he basically was going around pitching this. He raised $30 million for some really reputable people. And when you have a guy like Danny Glover uh, on your roster of people who, you know, who have invested, you know, obviously it turns into a big deal. So in towards, you know, obviously his story, at some point, these things all start falling apart. He's not paying people back. Um, and then, you know, I was hired by one of the investors and wanted to dig into sort of some some things about his past to see if there were any potential issues that they should be concerned about that, that would sort of suggest that this guy really isn't who he says he is. Because at the time, you know, with these guys, you don't have access to their books and records. You know, obviously, later on, when there's some sort of criminal or civil case, you'll get access to those sort of things. But at this point, we were just trying to understand whether or not this guy was legitimate, whether or not any of the stories he was telling were true. And he was sort of making these very bold claims. He claimed to own this multi-million dollar house. He, you know, he invited everybody to this house um, to celebrate to hit the completion of his house. He had 30 guests there. He had all these people. He had uh, artwork by famous art artists like Matisse. Um at this house and it was sort of, you know, a promotional thing. And they had a bunch of the investors there. And that was one of the things that the investor referenced to me. Turns out doing a little due diligence on my part, uh, that he actually never owned the house. He was renting the house from somebody else. He was paying like $15,000 a month. Um, and, and that was one of the, you know, sort of major red flags that we found. He had also claimed it to be this enormously successful business person. Um, but when you really start digging into his past, he had a bunch of, you know, he claimed to have generated $3 billion in shareholder value. That's a lot of billions. Uh, and that's a lot of money. And, and what we found is that he did work for some small, like, um, over the tra- uh, over the counter traded companies. Um, but one of them filed for bankruptcy and we looked at the financial statements of one of the old, one of his old companies um, and the time that he left, it had $800,000 in revenue, uh, <laughs> which is like a small investigative firm. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, those are some of the sort of red flags that, that we had found. We had also identified 20 lawsuits relating to him. Some of them were like smaller sort of fraud allegations that were very similar to what, you know, that the, were, were being alleged to him in some of, some of these cases. You know, he had reported to be worth $40 million, but he's fighting over $5,000 with a, a bunch of lawsuits. Um, he, he had claimed to being um, donating a lot of money to these local charities, but we found no evidence of that. He'd owed $450,000 in tax liens at the time. Um, one of the things that really jumped out to me that, and, and I love when fraudsters do this, they make things up that are sort of unprovable. Um, you know, they'll, they'll either have some sort of accolade that, you know, they were the first person to ever do this, or you know, the, the only person in the globe to ever eat 18 peanut butter jelly and sandwiches with, you know, in four seconds. Uh, and then they're like unprovable, you know, and, and what Ponzi schemers will do or fraudsters will do is they'll make, they'll make it that something that, you know, is obviously related to what, what they're trying to sell. Um, And in this case, what he was saying was that he was the first person to ever be awarded a millionaire residency with full citizenship status by President George H. Bush. That's where he wrote sort of everywhere. And people sort of like he, he posted this everywhere. And clearly nobody ever even Googled the term because if you Google it, he's the only person that is identified as that. So basically what he was suggesting, he was an Israeli citizen and he's claiming that George H. Bush 
uh, made him, and that's air quotes for those of you guys listening <laughs> for uh, listening out there, um, claimed that George H. Bush made him a citizen, uh, the first ever millionaire residency citizen. Now there's George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush, but there's no George H. Bush. And everything you would Google relating to millionaire residency was really to him. And nobody ever wrote this uh, sort of anywhere else. There were several other sort of red flags. He had all these different aliases. Like in one state, he was he lived in New York for a time. He was known as one thing. Uh, he you know, and he was living in San Francisco at the time. He was known as something else. Um, and which, as an investigator, you know, I know that. You know, any records that you're looking up or searches, criminal searches or anything that you're doing is obviously under one person's name. So if you have all of these aliases, um, it, it's just fascinating. Anyway, it turns out I did this research. I'm like, I'm convinced this guy is a fraudster. Ultimately, he gets indicted. He spent 20 something years in jail. Um, and some of the interesting things that came out at the trial was he you know, he had this private plane and he was renting, it was like a net jet private plane uh, for lack of a better term. I don't remember the exact details, but he claimed it was his. And anytime his wife or anybody else that was an investor or somebody that was important was getting onto the plane, he would have, I believe he'd have these special napkins made up that had his initials on it. He pretended like the plane was his and it really wasn't, uh, his plane. Um, and that was one of the sort of the interesting things. The other thing was he had fake Matisse paintings made. He had an artist create these fake paintings and pose, put them up on the wall so that when people went into his house, um, they thought that he had all this stuff. So it was just this fascinating story. You know, he, he, the, the, the term that, that was in a lot of the legal filings that he had all the trappings of success, um, he posted a lot of pictures of himself, like on the private jets. His wife wrote this um, ridiculous "How to Be a Kosher Billionaire," I think was the name of the book. So they 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 had posed as this extraordinarily wealthy couple, uh, and it turned out to be a whole bunch of um, lies. So I became fascinated with the story, and once it became public, I started just following it in the news media. Um, and I wrote about it on the blog and, and, and a lot of people came out and reached out to me. Uh, and in fact, I think Willie Cohen has actually released recently, um, uh, because he emailed me and told me that he had been released. So he was obviously paying attention to my blog too. So at least I got one reader there. Uh, so it's just, it was just one of those fascinating stories when, you know, as an investigator, you know, I'm digging into somebody and this happens quite often. I'm, I'm usually sort of pre fraud uh, or pre something breaks out. And I'm convinced to my core that somebody, uh, there's something not right. Uh, and it ultimately does pan out that way. And you give yourself a little bit of a pat on the back saying, like, you know, you can't, you know, I can never write a report saying this guy is a fraud, but hopefully this evidence shows <laughs> that you should, you should be very, very wary. Yeah. Well, and I think to me, how this, relates so well to financial statement fraud too, is that like you mentioned, he claimed all of these things. And then you did research to just see, are these claims true or not? Like, I think yeah. sometimes whenever you're thinking about a financial statement fraud or something that's just a little bit further removed, you know, whenever I think of like, if an investor is trying to solicit uh, investments or something publicly traded, like, oh my gosh, how am I going to access enough of their financial records for this to make sense? But you just started looking at, you know, can I validate these claims? I, I like that. Yeah, there's tons of ways to do that. I mean, there's an amazing amount of open source records and public records and deep web searches. And, you know, you know, I could call former employees of his or former people that he worked with and sort of get a sense about who they are. So it's, you know, I, I get jealous when you guys have access to all these deep records that I could never, ever touch without, you know, some sort of authority to do so or somebody gives them to you. And I'm trying to put trying to put the pieces together without without all those things, trying to understand who the person is. So you, know, you have to get a little creative sometimes, <laughs> uh, creative in totally legal, legitimate ways. But, um, you know, we were able to figure out that he never owned a plane. He didn't own this house, you know. Uh, the Bentleys and the cars that he says he had, you know, he was just leasing them. He didn't own them. And none of the things that he talked about, you know, he had $3 billion, billion dollars in, in value of companies. And it was all BS. I mean, from what we could tell online and $3 billion is a lot. If he said, 
you know, my company was worth 20 million or 30 million, it would be hard to really dispute because, you know, small uh, private companies, it's very difficult to get any information uh, out there on what kind of revenue they're generating or profits or anything like that. So if he had played it a little bit cooler, <laughs> uh, but ultimately, you know, guys like this, somebody's going to get pissed off. Somebody's going to file a lawsuit. You know, the government was going after him for taxes. I mean, there, there's certainly enough red flags and, and, you know, you know, the, one of the fascinating things with all this, and I've worked on these cases where I've, presented a lot of information that shows that, hey, you should probably stay away from these people. And they continue to invest in them. And they, you know, I'm ultimately, so there's some sort of psychology there too, with like, oh, I, I've been getting my money. And I think he's a good guy, or, you know, they really know what they're doing. So there's some psychology there too. So it's a fascinating world. Ponzi schemes are an obsession of mine. Ponzi schemes and catfishing. Yeah, and catfishing. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, so my story today is kind of merges a couple topics from both of you because one was it, it is an employee embezzlement, but this like... I don't know. I envision Ponzi scheme guys as like these narcissists who think that they can just get away with anything and everything or that they can charm their way out of things or uh, whatever. And so in my case, this guy was running a company and I think that he just got too big for his britches. And instead of just waiting for his payout of like when the owners were paid back so that he could get his profit share and things like that, he just started taking it ahead of time. And he had a couple other people in on the scheme too, because there were internal controls. Um, and so he needed some collusion and through different relationships and potentially like an affair, then he was able, I'm pretty confident there was an affair going on uh, <laughs> with the person who, you know, the controller, but because that's how he had to, he had to go through the controller to get the money out, you know, but man, this guy stole every which way, expense reimbursements, overpaying his, and he had a very generous salary. He had a profit sharing incentive, you know, all these things. And uh, he was also an accountant. Um, so he, I think those are really dangerous combinations when you've got all this power. And, uh, so he, he really just wanted to look like he had everything, which is hilarious because I mean, a lot of people just don't care either, you know, but he mm -hmm. just wanted to look so successful and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, um, it has been worked by law enforcement and the law exceeds $5 million over wow. like a seven year period. So the reason it fits into this discussion of like financial statement fraud is that he was an accountant. And so he knew how this business worked. And the he also knew that the owners were very sophisticated. They knew what their numbers should look like. They knew what ratios they wanted to see and all of that. And so they're were actual calculations that we found where they were just forcing those ratios or, you know, a ratio in the range that was expected, mainly on the P&L. And so then they would put everything else on the balance sheet or they would offset income that really couldn't be tracked. It was like extra income. And so they'd offset it there. They did end up having to amend quite a few tax returns. But yeah, just using those financial statements. And then what was interesting as well is that not only were they creating fraudulent financial statements for the owners, but they also needed, you know, at a certain point, somebody steals all the cash available is what I always say. Like somebody steals all the extra cash. They've stolen all the profit. So now they're having to, you know, they're running out of cash to even run their operations. And so he got a loan. He was able to get a loan from a bank for the company, a line of credit, max that out. Well, then they would have to report every year what their borrowing base was. So then they not only were they presenting fi uh, fraudulent financial statements to the owners, but they were also presenting fraudulent financial statements to the bank. So mm -hmm. because they knew what the borrowing base needed to be, so they would just move numbers around to do that by um, and I think on that one, it was by like shipping things early. Uh, that they weren't actually finished manufacturing, things like that. They'd mess with the timing of things. And um, he just kind of had his own little empire going and doing all of this until he was discovered. You said there was collusion between him and the controller. That was my question, yeah. too. Yeah, there was collusion there. And kind of crazy, because I really think the relationship is why the controller did it. Like, I don't yeah. why they went along, because there was really no financial benefit for the controller. She wasn't getting any financial benefit out of it? 
Mm-mm. Wow. No. So what's the status of that relationship right now? That's that's where I want to know. So <laughs> the controller is not how it was found out, but yeah. that relationship did end, but she kept processing everything for him. Mm. So mm. some drama for sure. Cause he moved on to somebody else. He was in too deep at that point. <laughs> yeah. I guess. I guess. I don't know. I never got to interview um, either of them, but yeah, it was pretty crazy. And actually, there were a few others involved as well. And the accounting staff was very familiar with what they were having to do. So when I went on site and talked to some of the accounting staff, they were like, oh, let me show you this spreadsheet, (laughs) you know, and... (laughs) I'm like, oh, this will maybe help us. But anyway, pretty, pretty crazy. And it was just all spent. There were no assets purchased that uh, that we found that could recover. I mean, it was just about spending money and ego and um, but no private planes, no ranches, you know, anything like that. It was just I don't know. It takes a special kind of person to spend that much money and not have any assets after that. I mean, like, what kind of stuff are you spending millions of dollars on? I know. It it was so wild. I really expected this person to have some monster house or, you know, really fancy cars. Nope. It was really modest. So anyway, really fascinating. Might be in Bitcoin in the uh, in the in the ether somewhere. (laughs) I don't think so. Not 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 this guy. (laughs) All right. So, Clay, if someone listening wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to connect? I can be reached by phone. Uh, my number's direct line is 501-978-8316. And my email address is cglasgow at hogantaylor.com. Okay. I'll make sure to put that in the show notes. And what about you, Brian? Probably the best way is through my website, diligentiagroup.com, D-I-L-I-G-E-N-T-I-A group.com. I am on every social media platform. You can imagine, minus TikTok, I think. Um, But LinkedIn is probably the best way uh, to get in touch with me. Okay, great. Well, thank you both for your time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Investigation Game Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review wherever you listen. The Investigation Game Podcast is a production of Workman Forensics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. To learn more about our investigation services and resources, please visit workmanforensics.com. If you have an investigation case story you'd like to share on a future episode, please email us at podcast at workmanforensics.com.